to say that the state is hiding over and over again and we get to hear the state's response all in this hearing so buckle up we're going to jump in make sure welcome to the revealing i am your host paparotti i'm here to discuss the Idaho 04 case as a disclaimer this channel is for entertainment purposes these are my opinions i'm not here to slander anyone and I am going to speculate on this one. So with that being said, let's get started. Now, I know I was going to take a break. So much for the break. Had some, had some personal issues. It's got me locked in this house like I just blew the dang motor in my truck. So I'm getting it fixed and, uh, you know, I'll get back busy here pretty soon, you know, because I, I like my truck. But what I wanted to talk about today, I mean, this is, uh, this is Friday, so I want to give you a Friday night Pavarotti video, and we are going to the timeline, folks. Now, there's something you should know about me, and people that have been watching me for a long time, they know this. I don't put out videos for no reason, regardless of how I present them. I always play 3D chess with this YouTube stuff. So I did a video a couple of days ago. I think I call it Bam, Bam, Bam. And if you haven't watched that video, stop this thing, go back and watch it. And then come back to it. You don't have to watch the videos I did between then, though. Um, it did. I did stir up a little bit. In the, I didn't really start up anything. I just wanted to make sure that uh, people didn't think I was trying to step on their toes, you know, and I wasn't. And I'm also not new to this case. Okay, I've been watching this thing since day one. And I've been watching all these content creators since day one. I just didn't throw my two cents in until I had a good grasp of what was going on, or I felt like I had a good grasp of what was going on. But you gotta know that when I do a video, there's probably gonna be something coming around about that video that you didn't expect to see. So when I went through the bam, bam, bam video, I presented it in a certain way. I'll show you today why I presented it that way. Because we are at the timeline, folks. Now let's revisit this timeline. You know, law enforcement, it is my speculation that from day one, when they went in and they investigated this crime scene, I've told you how their priorities are, right? Homicides here, big drug cases way up here, high priority, as they even say in their affidavit. Well, once they established the drug connection, and they did that the first day in this investigation, that's why they put out the, it was a targeted attack statements to the public. They established the drug connection. Their focus of their entire investigation from that point was to fill in the gaps in that. The other thing they established very quickly was there was two perps. Now, why do I say that? Well, you can go back to my really old videos and I'll explain how this, how this thing was taken down how this atrocity occurred and how there had to be two perps. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the two that were unalived upstairs were unalived with a different weapon in a different manner than the two downstairs. Just look at their injuries, even in the PCA. Upstairs, they're taken down by stabbing. Downstairs, it's sharp edged, a sharp edged weapon that means it wasn't a poke, it was a slash, and it was a larger weapon. So once they establish two different unaliving weapons, they're going to be looking for two different perpetrators. And that's the mindset of law enforcement, okay? Now, there's a lot of things about this case that has been hidden from you, and we're going to really touch on that in this video. So y'all might want to hang out for this whole video. Now... As I've mentioned, as you go through the search warrants of this investigation, up until November 29th, 
I mean, they had they they filed all their search warrants, but they hadn't had anything back because we can see when the search warrants came back, there was nothing leading them in the right direction on this investigation. And even after November 29th, there was no search warrants had come back that had any merit in what the investigation was was uh, was doing. I mean, there was there was nothing that was leading them into a particular direction until December 8th. Now on December 8th, they received a search warrant back from Amazon. That search warrant is redacted. Now we know by looking at all the search warrants that they never filed anything on Brian Koberger until December 23rd. And then after December 23rd, whoa, they filed everything on Brian Koberger trying to find anything that they can. But until December 23rd, zero. So I can attest that they're filing search warrant after search warrant for obscure stuff looking, I mean, they're, they're throwing, pardon my French, they're throwing crap against the wall trying to see what sticks. And not one thing had to do with Brian Koberger until December 23rd. If they would have had an inkling of him before December 23rd, they would have filed warrants, I assure you, because they did on everything else. But on December 8th, they did get a warrant back from Amazon. Now, I believe in that warrant, it's highly redacted, but I believe that they had a list of people who had actually purchased K-Bar knives. And in that list of people, it's speculation time, folks, in that list of people was Brent Kopaka. Now, sometime between December 8th and De December 14th, something else occurred. Somebody helped them narrow that list down to Mr. Kopaka. Now, all the redactions in this case are massive between December 8th and December 14th. It's my contention, the drug task force hit the streets. This has always been my contention if you watch my videos, but they hit the streets and they started pulling in their local snitches. Okay, and I'm not here to slander anyone, but their local snitches were obviously local low level drug dealers. And I believe that one of them that they pulled into this could have possibly been Emma Bailey. And I, I believe through my investigation of this case, Emma Bailey gave them Brent Kopaka's name. She had indirect knowledge of this. And then once she gave them his name, and that was sometime between the 8th and the 14th, they got a search warrant to search Brent Kopaka's apartment. It wasn't from a 911 call. That's why they've never released the 911 call because there isn't one. And that case has been closed, investigated, and even the, the officer who did the fatal shooting has been exonerated. So why wouldn't they release the 911 call? There's no reason because there isn't one. That's why. There was no 911 call. They were going there on that night to serve a search warrant. As they said in the police body cam, Brett, we've got a search warrant to search your apartment. Now that thing's been hidden like you wouldn't believe. But they went in, they unlived Brick Kopaka. Now why wouldn't they just put it out there? Okay, this is our prime suspect in this case. Well, let me tell you exactly why they wouldn't put it out there. Because they know this was a two-perk crime. They're not gonna put out, we've got one of them. Why? Because folks, once you put out there that it's a two perp crime, then the media narrative that they pushed in the PCA and throughout all mainstream media comes apart. If it's a two perp crime, then it wasn't a one off stalking incel. Okay. The university, the town, everything's hurt at that point. That's one reason. Now, the other reason is, I'm just going to leave it at that reason for now. All right, I got to hold a few things back. Okay, so after that, the next day, when Mr. Coburg and his father is pulled over on the way to Pennsylvania, first thing Mr. Koberger asked the officer that pulled him over was, have you heard about the Washington State shooting incident? He was trying to gather information. He wanted to know did they kill him or not? Or did they just catch him? And they're saying they killed him and he's in there talking. I guarantee you that's what Mr. Koberger, I'm speculating, that's what Mr. Koberger was thinking at that point. Because 
between December 15th and December 23rd when they filed that search warrant, again, they had nothing on Mr. Koberger. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Or they would have filed a search warrant. So what happened between the 15th and the 23rd? And I contend two things happened. One thing that didn't happen, and it's amazing, it's the exact same date. Okay, the exact same date on December 19th, law enforcement says they got back the IgG investigation. We know that that thing is no way impossible to do it that fast. They wanted to put the IgG information out there, though, in the public sphere, even though it says in the PCA that's not going to be admissible in court. They've already discussed how it's not admissible in court in court. So why put that IgG information even out there? because they needed a reason why they got to Mr. Koberger that they could put out in the public sphere. Without that reason of the IgG, they would have had to tell the whole story and they don't want to do that at this point. Number one, because at that point, they were still investigating the drug trafficking organization. But they still don't want to put it out now, even though I think it's about to come out, but they still don't want to put it out now because everybody's going to look shady as heck when they find out what the real investigation was and the real reasons for this crime was. And they'll know they were protecting the town, the college, and everything else. But December 19th, that's when they say they got the IgG back. I say something else. Because on December 19th, two things happened. The first thing is they got a Reddit warrant back. This one's different. They did a lot of Reddit warrants. But this one's different. This one came back on the 19th and it's redacted, redacted, redacted. That's not a Koberger Reddit warrant. That's a Kopaka Reddit warrant. So they went through Kopaka's Reddit history and they found their connection to Mr. Koberger on the 19th. That wasn't enough for them to start investigating Mr. Koberger though, because that connection I'm sure was obscure. So what else happened on December 19th? Well, on December 19th, that was when a young gentleman there named TF, who was picked back up by law enforcement after the atrocity took place, because he was let out on a furlough during the time of the atrocity that he absconded from because he had just been picked up on a drug trafficking charge that somebody had set him up on. That was the date in court that he made the deal, the deal of the century. This guy has 45 prior arrests, was arrested for drug trafficking, over a pound, two probation violations, possession, 30 fentanyl pills, and possession of paraphernalia. He made the deal of the century between him, Kathy Mabbitt, his deputy, I mean, his assigned pro, uh, public defender, Bill Thompson, and John Judge on the 19th of December in Latow County made the deal of the century. Got all of his charges reduced to simple possession and got probation on the 19th. That correlated his information that he gave them with the Reddit warrant that came back from Mr. Kopaka. Now, why am I so certain of this? Well, let's take a little trip back in time because those little things that came out a while back called the Steve G texts sure told us a lot, didn't it? Okay, what have you heard about the protected witness? Protected witness. Now, if you look through a lot of the court documents, you'll see that there are a lot of redactions in there, and some of those redactions state it could cause harm to individuals if that information was released. So if you have a protected witness, who would harm them if this is a one-off in cell Ted Bundy guy that was stalking some young ladies and he just went in and all on his own committed this atrocity and you've got him in custody and you know 
that you've got the right guy according to law enforcement and the you know the media narrative then why were why would these witnesses be in danger why would anybody be in danger at this point all the danger should be gone even if his associate was involved and they knew it well he's gone too right law enforcement took care of him so who is left to put somebody in danger why would a witness be protected hmm well let's think about that for a minute read the next one i have to keep the witness under wraps the fbi warned me they don't play games with protected informants and they could be monitoring everything i say we've noticed some quite odd communications and behaviors the FBI don't play games with their protected informants. Once again, what are they protecting? And what did this informant know about Mr. Koberger? Where did they get this informant? Who is this informant? Who would hurt this informant? Why are they in danger? Hmm. He went down because of the informant. He didn't plan on getting caught. So I believe he's referring to Mr. Koberger in that sentence. He went down because of the informant. He didn't plan on getting caught. So what you're saying there then, SG, is he didn't go down because of the knife sheath. He didn't go down because of the DNA on the knife sheath. He didn't go down because of the video of his car. He didn't go down because of the cast records of his phone. He didn't go down because of the IGG investigation. He went down because of the informant. Because he didn't plan on getting caught. So what you're saying is he didn't plan on getting caught, so he was very careful at the crime scene. He didn't leave any evidence. And we'll get into a little bit more of that here in just a minute. This one told the FBI and is under their protection. Hence, why the FBI warned me not to pursue the lead I found. Quit chasing that one, guy. That one there might get you in trouble. That one is protected. They're in danger. I cannot say anything or they will come after me. That is literally what they told me. They must be serious if they threatened the father of one of the victims in this case. Follow that lead, mess with that informant, and we'll come after you. Yeah, that's, that sounds like some high priority there to me. Must be something else going on. Hmm. Figure that out here in just a minute, won't we? They wrote Gray informing us this informant used some protected tip line. And if we expose them, we could be held liable. Protected tip line, huh? Well, yeah, because that's what everybody uses when they you know, turn in tips on investigations such as this. They don't use the tip. They use the protected tip line. Everybody know how to get a hold of that protected tip line? Oh, you don't? Right, because there is not a protected tip line. The protected tip line is, you know what, they, they go to you, you don't go to them. There is so much more to this story than is in the media, you don't say. Hence, the real reason for the gag order, you don't say. So, what you're saying then is... The real reason for the gag order is all the information that's not in the media. All those things that they won't talk about, like this informant that's in danger. Wonder why they're in danger. Maybe because that informant turned in a member of an organization who was doing work for that organization and that organization's still there. They're still being investigated by that drug task force. Maybe that's all the stuff that's 
hinted to be the real reason for the gag order and it's not in the media and nobody can talk about. Hmm. Well, that actually has some history. But I was told she, meaning Xana, did not party. Oh, I mean, she didn't. She did party drugs. I'm sorry. I was told that she did party drugs like Molly, which Molly is just a synthetic type of stimulant. It's nothing. But nothing that was hardcore that could lead to something like this. Well, let's look at this statement here for just a second. Because there, again, let's listen on the third level. There's two parts to this statement. Xana's family has some history. Cut it off. But I was told Xana did party drugs like Molly, and but nothing that was hardcore that could lead to something like this. But what he didn't say was Xana's family has some history but nothing that was hardcore that could lead to something like this. No, he didn't say that, did he? No, he said this is a two-part statement. The first part is Xana's family has some history. And by not including that in his next statement, we can just assume the opposite. Xana's family has some history and it was hardcore that could lead to something like this. I mean, that's what we could infer easily from that. I say Kopeka's phone here. I meant to say Koberger's phone. Right. Then on December 23rd, they finally got their first search warrant for Mr. Kopeka's phone filed. And then the dominoes went into play after that. But we're not done, are we? Let's go back to that video that I made a couple of days ago about that Blaker affidavit and the wording in there. Because when he filed that affidavit, they already had the K-Bar knife sheath in their custody. At that point, there is no hiding the fact that they at least tried to do a reverse IgG investigation. They at least matched up the DNA off of something with Mr. Koberger's father, because when they filed that search warrant, things were fixing to get serious. They were going to arrest him. So to put that in there about looking for the murder weapon in any sheath for the murder weapon would have been idiotically contradictory at that point, wouldn't it? And it's been looked over. They didn't submit it without extra eyes being put on it. Because here's the facts. They already had the knife sheath for the K-Bar. They already had proof through Amazon purchases that Mr. Kopaka had purchased that K-Bar. They're looking for the second perpetrator in this case when they're going into Mr. Koberger's apartment. And what did we already discuss? The second perpetrator used what? He used a different weapon with different methods in that weapon. So when he says the likely murder weapon along with any sheath from that weapon, that means they're looking for the second murder weapon. So while everybody may have found that thing before old Pavarotti did the other day, it was immaterial. I was pointing it out because I was going to bring it up right now, folks, because this is the real timeline of what took place. They also had to find the second perp that matched the car because the first perp's car, he didn't even have one and his parents' silver one wasn't going to suffice. They've always been looking for two and they didn't stop until they got two in custody. And how can they hide this from the public? How can this possibly be a possibility, Pavarotti? Because they want to hide. I think that's fair game for the public to hear. If she wants to talk about things that are in the affidavit and she wants to talk about things the state is trying to hide. Those are just my opinions and speculations. But folks, please like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, I want you to post your comments, post your criticisms, criticisms. And your thoughts. You know, I want to hear your thoughts, especially on this one, because I know I'm going to stir some folks up with this one. 
But you know what? You only believe what you believe. And when you look at the facts in this case, I don't see how people can't believe and how they believe anything else. This is my opinion. But y'all have a great weekend. I hope this is a good video for y'all to ponder on this Friday night. And Pavarotti's out!